I've always looked much younger than my actual age. Back when I was a teenager and rolling into my early to mid-twenties, this was a huge problem for me as I used to always get carded for alcohol or get talked down to because I looked like a kid. But now I'm in my mid-thirties, it kind of works in my favor. But back when I was a teenager, the whole looking like a kid thing almost got me abducted once. And this is that story. It was just after my 14th birthday when my grandpa decided to take me and my little brother on a trip to the gas station to pick up diesel for the tractor. I know that doesn't sound very exciting, but back then, we all lived on a dairy farm way out in the sticks, so there wasn't much else to do, and seeing the shiny gas station with all the snacks and candy was something of a major event for us. Kind of sad, I know, but whatever. Anyways, we rode over there, three deep in his single cab Chevy S10, with me in the middle seat and my little brother on the passenger side. When we get to the gas station, my grandfather parks at a pump and heads inside. Only thing is, when he turns off the engine, he leaves the key in the ignition with us buckled inside of it. Considering we lived on the outskirts of a small town with next to nobody in it, and where basically nothing happens, this wasn't unusual. There was always a sense of trust and community where I grew up, and since everyone knew everyone else, it was totally normal to leave your doors and garages unlocked, leave your wallet in the local diner in view, and you get the idea. Anyways, just after my grandpa walked into the gas station to make small talk with the clerk, like I said, everyone knew everyone, this guy just appears at the passenger side window and starts trying to talk to my brother. We'd been brought up to be friendly and polite to folks, even to strangers. But while my brother seemed only too happy to talk to the guy, even if he was a little shy, I got this straight up bad feeling about the guy, like deep down in my gut. I know it might sound a little kooky of me, but you know when people on the TV talk about how they can see people's auras floating around them as they're talking? There was always something clinging to that guy that, although I couldn't see it, I could feel it. Maybe it was the way he was looking at my little brother that set off my spidey senses or whatever, but the second I laid eyes on him, I got to praying that my grandpa would come back, quick. I don't even think about the fact that he might see the truck key still in the ignition. I didn't think that he'd do anything crazy at all for that matter. So when he did, geez, Louise, I just about freaked out in my skull. After talking to my brother with that devilish smirk on his face, he gets to looking around the inside of the truck, probably for something to steal or something. But then he sees the truck keys, how they're just dangling there in the ignition and, oh my god, the smile that appeared on his face was without a doubt the absolute most evil, predatory thing I've ever seen in my life. But even then, my first thought is, he's going to take grandpa's truck like I really couldn't even fathom what he might actually have in mind. As the man started making his way around to the driver's side, I started telling my little brother, get out of the truck. He's all like, why? And then I give him my big sister look and say, that's a bad man, James. He wants grandpa's truck. And immediately my little brother starts trying to undo the buckle of his safety belt. But the moment he even went to do it, it was like I could see the disaster unfolding before my eyes. My grandpa's truck was all beat up and hardly anything actually worked on it except the engine that made the thing scoot. And one of the things that notoriously didn't work was the safety belt release button on the passenger side. A lot of the times it was just kind of funny, like I remember my dad not being able to undo it and being like, well, I guess this is my life now, I live in my dad's truck. But let me tell you, the time my little brother got stuck in the car and I thought that he was about to be abducted. Completely terrifying. Like I said, I still didn't think that he wanted anything but Grandpa's truck, so I was just focused on getting my brother and me out of it so the evil grin guy could just drive off with it if he wanted to. But then as he opened the door and climbed into the driver's seat, he grabbed me by the arm so I couldn't get out. All the while, my little brother is still struggling with the buckle. Then with that same evil smile on his face, a grin that said he'd been gifted with the one thing he wanted in the world, he said, you two are my kids now. 
It hit me that me and my little brother were in way, way more trouble than we first thought, and I went into Big Sister Overdrive to try and protect him. I remember how my grandpa kept a bunch of old tools underneath the front seat, mostly because his truck was just a mess, not out of any big desire to protect himself or stash a weapon or anything like that. Then even with the guy's hand wrapped around my arm, I had just enough wiggle room to reach underneath the seat and grab the first loose piece of metal I could find, which just so happened to be some kind of wrench. Then I came up and just started beating on the guy, stopping him from starting up the engine as he tried to stop me from hitting him. I remember being scared for me and my brother, but I also remember being scared that I might end up killing the guy or something, that I'd have to actually bash his brains in to be able to keep us safe. I didn't want to hurt anyone. I didn't want to hurt anyone. I didn't want it to be happening at all, but my grandpa wasn't there to help and I didn't think that he'd realize what was going on in time for him to stop it. Thankfully, he was wrong about that, as he and the clerk had noticed someone getting into his truck almost the moment it happened. So maybe only a couple of seconds after I started beating on the guy, my grandpa appears at the driver's side door and just starts dragging the guy out of the seat before throwing him onto the ground. Both me and my little brother were crying and hollering by this point, and I remember just throwing my arms around him and saying, it's okay, we're okay now, as grandpa just started beating the life out of this guy before he straight up sat on the guy and yelled at the gas station's clerk to call the police. I remember watching the clerk, how before he ran back into the gas station, he gave my grandpa this big old six-shooter pistol, and although the guy was struggling on the ground at first with grandpa sat on him, all it took was him pointing the gun at the guy's face, and he just stopped bucking and trying to hit grandpa and put his hands up above his head with a scared look on his face. Grandpa then told us to get out of the truck and go inside the gas station to wait with the clerk. I found out years later that Grandpa had actually planned on just killing the guy right there, and he didn't want us to see it. He didn't though, and somehow he found the restraint to just keep the gun aimed at his head until the sheriff and one of his deputies screamed into the gas station and took control of the situation. It was a huge deal back in the early 90s in our small town, as, like I might have mentioned already, there was basically no crime at all back then. Only other thing I can remember that caused as much of a stir was when three guys from Arkansas tried to start up a meth lab in our county, and it ended up exploding on them and causing this huge fire. Lots of people were saying last time anything this crazy happened was when dot dot dot, and then they'd give either me or my little brother a look and then just stop talking. Had me thinking about what happened to us a lot around that time, and as I got older I realized more and more just how lucky we really were. My name is Emma, I'm from the UK, and I have a story I think you might be interested in. I've loved horses and ponies all my life, and whenever I can, I get out into the countryside to go pony trekking. This usually involves walking and trotting around a variety of forests here in England and Wales. Nothing too strenuous, and I usually find it to be a very relaxing and centering experience. But the last time I went, something happened that was actually one of the creepiest things I've ever experienced. We were up in a place called Kielder Forest Park in Northumberland, and although we had some experienced guides with us, it was my first time up there. Kielder also has one of the longest pony tracks in the whole of the UK, which means you can literally ride for hours without having to loop back on yourself. I don't really mind having to repeat a trail, it's all the more time on a horseback, but it definitely does take a bit of the excitement away knowing that you're just going in circles. So, with that in mind, you can understand why I was quite excited to get up there. Only about two-thirds into the ride, our ponies started to get a little bit skittish. Now, I know ponies can be some of the most temperamental creatures on earth, but if they don't like you or they're not in the mood to be ridden, they'll let you know as soon as you try to saddle them up. It's not like they get halfway into a ride and decide, forget this, I'm done. They also tend not to be scared of much as they know a bite or a swift kick is 
the likely solution to any other problems, and honestly, they'd be mostly right about that. So, as you can imagine, we were really confused when our ponies started freaking out on this section of track that was lined with trees. They seemed absolutely terrified, and for no discernible reason, it was so bad that at one point, my pony, Shamrock, actually tried to throw me off. I did everything I could, but nothing could calm her down. She was whinnying and doing 360s trying to spot whatever was scaring them. I was doing the same, but I saw absolutely nothing among the trees. You'd think the ponies would want to get out of the area if they were so scared, but they all just huddled together on the trail and refused to budge. In the end, we had to dismount and literally drag the ponies along the rest of the track, and one of the girls ended up getting a nasty kick from one particularly frightened pony, so naturally she was very upset. We were all quite shaken by the time we emerged from the trail, and one of the first things we asked the guides was what could have caused the ponies to freak out in such a way. Personally, I thought it might have been someone's dog running around the forest, then it could have been a domino effect with one pony after another getting spooked. But according to the guides, a border collie lived on the same farm the ponies were stabled at, so it's not like they weren't familiar with them. The guides rejected the idea that it was a fox or a badger scaring the ponies too. I mean, they really had no idea what it was, hence why they were just as freaked out as us, I suppose. I'm not saying that there was some bloody monster in the woods or something. I'm not one for ghost stories either. But sometimes I find myself wondering what exactly scared those poor ponies so much. We don't have bears or wolves or coyotes or mountain lions over here, and you're more at risk of a seagull attack than anything else in England. So what could have been out there, hiding among the trees, that could have scared the bejesus out of the ponies like that? I'd always thought our woods and forests here are pretty safe places to be, but maybe I was wrong. All I know is that I'm going to be much more careful in the future. So, I'm a bartender at a gentleman's club. Our uniform, if you can call it that, is a very short, skimpy black dress and black bra. Due to my uniform being the way it is, I do my best not to go out in public directly after work due to dirty looks or perverted comments that I just don't have time for. Back before the current state of the world, I had just gotten off of work. It was around 2.30 a.m., and I decided to run to my local Walmart to grab some dog food and other household items that I needed, thinking that there really wouldn't be anyone there besides staff. I ran in with a jacket to try and be a little modest and went directly to the pet aisle. There was a guy stocking the shelves, I gave a wave and smiled and proceeded looking for my dog's brand of food. I grabbed a 20 pound bag and the stalker asked if I needed help. I'm not a really small girl but I have a slight frame, like I'm tall but I have a small waist. I told him I was fine, but thanked him and headed to the grocery section. I was in the freezer section when my stalker showed up again, this time with another guy. They were just standing there watching me decide which pizza to pick and when I turned to leave, the stalker asked me again if I needed help. I told him no but thanked him again and smiled. I then made my way to the checkout aisle. On my way out I saw a man heading out about 10 feet behind me. I quickly walked to my car, threw my purchases in the passenger side and jumped in and locked my doors. I was worried that he would try and talk to me and I just wanted to go home. I felt dumb after realizing the guy went to his own car and wasn't even near me and started my 15 minute drive home. I was about halfway home when I noticed this black car behind me, taking all the same turns as me. I live in a rural area and while it's possible he lived nearby, there aren't many people that take these roads. I turned a road after mine and he made the same turn. It leads to a dead-end road with a cow farm so I knew that he was following me. I get to the end of the road and do a quick three-point turn and speed back out to the road and he's still behind me. I called my boyfriend and told him what was going on and that I didn't want to drive home where he would know where we lived and asked him to meet me at a Walmart. I speed the whole way there hoping a cop is sitting somewhere and will pull us over black car guy is still directly on my butt no matter how fast I was going. 
I pull into the Walmart parking lot and park under a street lamp. The black car pulls into the same spot across from mine, and I'm freaking out. About 15 seconds later, I see my boyfriend's truck, and he pulls in, more like drifts in, up next to me, and asks if I'm okay, and I point to the car. Now, my boyfriend is not a small man. He's about 6'4", and pretty large, like his arms are the size of my head. He's very intimidating, but a very quiet and kind individual. He gets out of his truck and starts to walk over to the car and yells to them, You need to talk to her or something? And the guy in the black car just backs out and takes off. I don't know if it was the same man that was at the store earlier or what, but I don't go out after work anymore. I'm in London in the UK. Currently, at the time that I'm writing this, we're in the Tier 4 lockdown. Stay in your home, only go out for shopping, trips, or exercise. No mixing with people outside of your own home and your own support bubble, etc. And with the current mutation rampaging through London, hospital beds are nearly a capacity and apparently the death tolls are starting to rise, and it made sense to stay indoors as much as possible. But every human being has a breaking point, and Mine was eight days of wandering around my one-bedroom apartment. I had talked myself out on Zoom and run out of conversations to talk to myself about. At 10 p.m., New Year's Eve, I decided to get some air, and which was allowed with the rules of Tier 4, and I go out for a quick walk around the perimeter around the local park, all on main roads, and it takes about 40 minutes. The plan was to stop at a local grocery store and pick up a bottle of red wine on the way back. I step out with masks firmly affixed and started walking. One thing that I was not prepared for was the eerily empty and almost silent streets. As it was just below freezing, I decided to hustle and cut through some side streets first. On hindsight, a big mistake. Navigating myself through very quiet side streets, I neared the park when I saw a van, a Mercedes Sprinter size, and it turned in and rapidly approached me. Deciding to let them pass before crossing, I came to a halt. The van began to slow as it approached me. I could see the cab was occupied by two men between the ages of 25 to 40 years of age. Then it stopped, window rolled down, and one man leaned out. Hey friend, we're lost. Can you tell me where the station is? And the accent was not from the UK, and I'm not going to state its origin as I'm not going to get into stereotypes, but... Alarm bells began to ring out immediately. What was a van doing out at this time and why directions to the local train station in the middle of a lockdown? The van had stopped so the side door was facing me. I stepped back a few paces and gave directions very quickly. I didn't understand at all. I, I think it's best if you show us. With that, he opens his door and the side door to the van opens to reveal another two men. I just turned and ran. I knew what was going on, and I ran down the side street that I had emerged from. Uh, uh, take the van around. Follow him. I heard them yell. Knowing that these guys were fitter, younger than I, a foot race to my apartment building was out of the question. The only advantage I had was a head start and, hopefully, local knowledge of the streets. The side street leads into a larger street that has homes, all with large hedges. I ran past a few homes and entered the front garden of a house that had the most imposing and opaque hedge. It was unlit. I ducked down. Lucky for me, that house did not have a motion sensor light. Within a few seconds, I could hear footsteps. They went past me and stopped. I peeked through the hedge vegetation with a very limited view to see the man who had asked for directions. He was a few houses down from me and on the opposite side of the street. He was looking around, then the sound of the vehicle. I thought, oh no, the van. But luckily for me, it was a car. The man looked at his phone, looked around, pretending that he was just checking something and then walked, leaving the residential street as quickly as possible and the car continued its way. I waited for another ten minutes, sitting behind the hedge in the front garden, practicing an explanation if the house lights came on. The house stayed unlit. 
and after my allotted time, I arose and quickly walked back to my apartment building, keeping to the shadows and reacting to almost every sound. I made it back, bolted the front door, and only when I sat down did I understand what I had just avoided. All this for some air and bottle of red. I poured myself a black coffee and debated calling the police, but what would I say? Had anything really happened that they could act on? Intuition of being kidnapped or being in danger is not enough evidence. Plus, being a man, this would not be a priority, especially in a night that they would be overstretched on. I just waited in the new year realizing that I had a lucky escape and that I should stock up on red wine at a more decent time. So this happened to me at some point between the cusp of fall and winter last year, in 2019, and with no craziness rampaging through us yet. At the time, my husband and I both worked weekend night shift jobs, him at an IT service and me as a CNA in the local hospital's ICU. As we had no reason to be up and awake during the day, we lived a rather vampire-like schedule, sleeping all day and staying up all night. Four days off, three 12-hour shifts a week, it just worked. The best part about being a night dweller is the fact that you can go, or used to be able to go, in the middle of the night to do your grocery shopping. No lines, no hustle and bustle, you just go at your own leisure and dodge the occasional pallet of stock or graveyard shift worker who's filling up the shelves and probably wishing everyone present would quit taking things away right as he stocks them. But anyways, it's 2am, peak energy time for me and the hubs. This Walmart is in a pretty decent part of town and everything's well lit so I typically don't feel nervous walking around in the middle of the night. Hubs did tours in Iraq and has a good head on his shoulders so even less reason to be concerned, right? Right. As we walk through the entrance, my eyes immediately drift towards the seasonal section. I have ADHD and am a pain to shop with according to Hubs as I tend to wander off when something neat catches my attention. Unbeknownst to me, my hubby notices a small gaggle of young adults behaving rather immaturely, i.e. riding around in the electric handicap carts, intentionally smashing into displays, causing some general havoc. Oblivious to this all, I'm still wandering around while he patiently follows after, filling our cart here and there along the way. He sees these kid adults causing more trouble near the back of the store in the food almost shoes section but once again my attention was on more important things like looking at the blind bag toys that I have absolutely no need for. We make it to the end of our shopping journey and head towards the self checkout since they don't bother staffing the actual lanes in the middle of the night. While he scans and bags I excuse myself to use the restroom and to go after a couple of Pokemon on my Pokemon Go game. I dilly-dally long enough that he's checked out and back at the car by the time I come out, so I make my way over to the compact SUV and modern-day station wagon that we own, where he's busy loading the groceries into the trunk. Hubs is very particular about how things are packed, which is fine by me, so we have a system. He loads, I return the cart to the cart holder thing. While I wait for him to finish loading, I hear a bunch of snickering and laughter coming from the car to the right of ours so the cart and hubs is in between me and the other vehicle. I wasn't aware at the time, but these kid adults had been sitting in their car the entire time as he was unloading our spoils of war into the trunk, mocking and jeering at him for basic things, like what he's wearing on his shirt, it was a Pokemon logo if anyone cares, and other trivial things. Once I got there, however, all focus turned towards me. It took me a second to realize that they were actually addressing us, but Soon I could make out what they were saying. They were laughing at my husband, asking him if he actually censored a whale like me. Now, I'm no string bean by a long shot. I have some decent curves going on. So they honed in on my size and appearance. In my defense, does anyone really dress up to go to Walmart at 2am and encourage each other to keep throwing pot shots in our direction at the fact we were together anything they could think of to make fun of us with. Being the sensitive, self-conscious soul that I am, I could already feel my eyes start to water. 
I figured that we would just finish what we were doing and leave them behind in their gloating and foolishness, but Hubs, Hubs wasn't going to have any of it. It was one thing, according to him, for them to mock him, but when they started being cruel about me, he'd hit his limit. He's truly a non-violent man, but he was so riled up by what they were saying that he balled up his fist, raised his voice, and told them to shut up with a decent smack against their side window, which had rolled up upon Hub's approach. My knight in shining armor coming to my defenses, I thought. That action caused a series of quick, chaotic reactions. The young men, three of them, started angrily yelling and I distinctly heard one of them ask the other if he wanted his gun, to which the ringleader said, yeah, give it. Holy pokeballs, I thought. I tell my hubs to get in the car and, in a panicked rush, decided to abandon the shopping cart in front of their car in hopes of creating an obstacle for them. I fling myself into the SUV and by this point, one young man has started smacking on the hood of our car while another steps behind it trying to block us in. I vividly remember through my blurry vision seeing a young woman in the backseat of their vehicle looking somewhat embarrassed as she mouthed, I'm sorry, in my direction. No time to think about that, not with the ringleader appearing from the car at any moment. Hubs pulls the car in reverse, and the young man behind us had no choice but to move, lest he become a human pancake. Hubs drives off out of the parking lot like a bat out of heck, and it's clearly evident that my cart obstacle did little to delay them, as their dodge dart was right on our tail, flying down the road right behind us. We made it through one green light before they caught up to us, sidling up in the lane next to us as I'm trying to remember to breathe, thoughts going on in a hundred different directions. Thanks, ADHD brain. I see the passenger window roll down and out comes a hand with a gun, pointed right in my, or rather, hub's direction. I scream something to the effect of them having a gun, though I'm sure it came out as incoherent shrieking in actuality. Hubs got the point though and chose in that moment to swerve directly at them with our vehicle, leaving them no choice but to drive onto the median or be hit by a bigger vehicle going 70 to 80 miles an hour. They swerved, which slowed them down so Hubs hit the gas and kept driving, ignoring red lights along the way. Finally pulling myself together, I dialed 911 on my cell phone and since the police station wasn't exactly nearby, the operator arranged to have some cops meet us at a local church a mile or two from where we currently were. Hubs keeps driving forward, car still at our heels and he somehow managed to swerve a turn in the middle of the intersection while making it look like we intended to go forward. Other car flies on while we tail it to the cops at the church. They took down our statements and sent a few cars out to try to find them. I was completely useless when it comes to details but Hubs came through to save the day and could tell them the make, model, color of the car and describe details about the individuals. All I could remember in my mind was the face of the girl who mouthed the I'm sorry and lo and behold, I kid you not, one of the officers took us to his car, flipped through his fancy police computers and the on screen pops the image of the same girl I'd seen in the Walmart parking lot. Another click and the same young men, save for one, were the one put on the screen. Apparently these upstanding citizens had been confronted by the police department only nights prior. I wish I could remember the charges, but my mind was overwhelmed by that point. Most of the details are a blur, like my mind intentionally tried to redact things to protect itself or something. Now needless to say, I developed genuine anxiety about going to Walmart in the middle of the night after that. Thankfully we both transitioned into daytime jobs since then, so we share the pain of daywalkers' normal grocery store woes these days. At the time of the story, I had just finished my sixth grade year and was very athletic and took runs every day. This encounter occurred in the summer and comes with summer, heat. So instead of running in the day when it was hotter, I began running in the evening when the sun was going down. On the day of the encounter, I followed my normal routine. I told my mom I was going to start my run and then began to listen to my music on my iPod shuffle. 
Now the way my neighborhood works is that there is only one entrance, which doubles as the only exit as well. I live in a suburban area, so the main road that passes the entrance of my neighborhood isn't very busy, but it isn't empty either. On the day, I was running down the main road of my neighborhood that all the small streets branch off of. I was close to the entrance and could clearly see all the cars passing by. I'm also clearly visible to all cars passing by. And I remember watching this gray Honda car slam on its brakes at the entrance on my neighborhood. This was done so fast and so hard that I heard the tires squeal over the song that I was listening to at full volume. I brushed it off as someone following directions that most likely nearly missed my neighborhood's entrance. The car began up the road I was running on, going extremely slow at least 10 miles an hour under the speed limit. I could make out three shadows in the car through the darkness and a little light from the house porch lights, two at the front of the car and some in the back seat. As I passed the car I saw the driver's side window was down. I gave the car a smile and a wave and I turned down a small street that branched off the road I was running on. Now I remember feeling extremely on edge as I checked over my shoulder. I saw the car turn around in the middle of the road and then slowly down the street that I was running on. Again, I chalked it up to misinterpreting directions and try not to think too much of it, and I really began to freak out. As a girl of my age, I always would jump to the worst possible outcome. I wasn't very tall and only stood about 5'2", so I knew that I could be easily mishandled if the people in the car had any ill intentions. But I knew that was very unlikely, so I tried to tell myself to calm down. I reached the cul-de-sac at the end of the street, so I was now running on the opposite side of the car. They were still going very slowly, and what I do next may have saved my life, and I can't imagine what would have happened if I didn't. As the car and I were about to be right next to each other, I paused my music and kept my earbuds in, giving the illusion that I was still listening. As the car and I got closer, I heard the two men speaking. One of them actually tried to speak to me, yelling hey or something like that to get my attention, but I didn't reply because I knew that it would blow my cover and that they would know that I was able to hear them. As the car drove a little bit behind me and out of my view, I heard one of them say, We'll get her when we turn back around. I froze. Get me? I felt like something dumped a bucket of freezing water on my head. I knew they had to go around the cul-de-sac, so I did the only thing I could think of. I instantly sprinted. As I ran down the street, I looked over my shoulder and saw the car had already went around the cul-de-sac and was now going a lot faster after me. I turned into the main road in my neighborhood and ran. I passed my street and just ran as fast as I could towards the end of my neighborhood. My house was the first in my street, so I knew that they would see where I lived if I tried to go home. I was scared to death and essentially running for my life. I had no idea what I could do to get away from these people, so I just pushed my body to go as fast as possible. I continued to check over my shoulder, hoping maybe they wouldn't be there, but they were. They were right behind me, and I distinctly remember they were silent. I'd imagined them yelling at each other that I was going to get away, but they were chasing me in silence. To me, that was creepier than if they would be yelling. When I ran down the last street in the neighborhood, I started running through backyards. That was the only thing I had left to do. I heard the car slam on its brakes, turn off its engine, and three doors slam. My heartbeat sped up. I was so convinced that they were going to begin chasing after me through those backyards. Get back in the car. We won't find her like this. My heart dropped. As I heard three doors shut and the car engine start up again. Now that I was running through backyards, I would have to run across the streets too. This is the scariest part for me because I would be very visible to the people in the car if they were going to be driving down the main road. I remember staring at the street trying to decide whether or not I should try to wait it out or if I should just book it home. I went with book it home. I didn't even check my shoulder as I ran through backyards, jumped over fences and ran across the streets. I was just waiting for car lights to light up the area around me or for arms to wrap around me, but thankfully it never happened. Somehow the car must have turned down the wrong streets or completely missed me and I truly believe that it's the luckiest thing that's ever happened to me. When I got to my house, I wasted no time jumping through the door. 
Once I slammed my door shut, I sat on the ground and thought about what had just happened and what could have happened. I never ended up telling my parents until years later, and I didn't call the police. But if they are still out there, I hope they are locked up somewhere so they can't ever terrorize a child again. I can't imagine what they would have done to me if they ever caught me. And needless to say, I hope I never see them again. Years ago, I was on my way to Minneapolis, Minnesota from Boondock, Egypt, Minnesota. I was making the trip alone. I drove as much as I could handle, stopping only for gas and bathroom breaks. It was late at night and I decided to call it quits when I stopped in this little nothing town called Rothsay. I checked into this little motel to regroup for the night and decided to bebop on over to this 24-hour truck stop for some food. It wasn't far, so I grabbed my coat out of my car and went over on foot. So, some background about me. I have always been super cautious about stranger danger. My mom was into true crime and drilled it into me that any situation could be dangerous, so I need to stay vigilant and be prepared in case any sort of altercation happens with a creep. I always watch the people around me when I'm out and pay attention to what's going on. When this happened, I had pepper spray clipped on the inside breast pocket of my leather and my stun gun, machete, and baton in my car just in case stuff like this incident were ever to go south. I also had two gas cans, jumper cables, vehicle fluids, etc. in my car in case of an emergency. I felt okay with being myself because of all of this. To anyone who saw me, I was an 18-year-old female traveling by myself in a dumpy O2 Ford Vic with out-of-state plates. And if they bothered to look into it specifically with a county number of a town with a population of like 600 to 700. So to creeps with bad intentions, I obviously had potential of being a vulnerable target on which to pull some nonsense with. I still was friendly with strangers and willing to help anyone in need, but this incident made me a bit leery about it from then on. I really feel like something awful would have went down if it had not been for the red flags that I saw and me questioning my situation. I stopped putting myself out there like this after it happened. While I was walking to that truck stop, I noticed a parked car with the door open and some dude just half sitting at it smoking a cigarette and messing with stuff in the car. I took note because he looked at me and kind of put off sketchy vibes. A lady, maybe 30 years old, comes out of the truck stop and approached me. She was a little off, like I'm fairly sure she was an addict and was high at the time. I was an addict once and don't look down on them, so I greeted her kindly when she walked up to me and she said, I am stranded here and need help. My car just died and I think I ran out of gas. So I told her that I'd be glad to help and offered to put 25 in the tank and she said the car wasn't here. It had died on the road. I was like, okay, no problem. I always keep gas cans and jumper cables in case of something like this, so no worries. I could give her one of my gas cans and take gas back to it. And she responds, can I get a ride to my car? So I asked her where it was, and she responds, Oh, not that far, I suppose. It would just be nice to get a ride. Will you take me to my car? I told her I was actually about to head into the truck stop to get something to eat just now, but it would be no problem at all to let her take a gas can. She floundered and changed it to, Well, I, I'm actually, I'm not sure if it's out of gas. It, it could have just died because of the bad battery. He said you have cables, so would you try to jumpstart my car? Odd uh, thing is, the whole time I was talking to her, she kept glancing over at the dude in the car. She seemed insistent that I get in my car and take her somewhere. And these things just clicked. Alarms went off in my mind, and I knew that there was no way I was giving this woman a ride anywhere. So many red flags, and at this point, I felt like it was some sort of scam to maybe rob me or steal my car or something of that sort just due to how sketchy she was being and because she kept looking over at the guy in the car throughout this I did wonder if maybe she was afraid of the man for some reason maybe in a bad relationship and trying to get away from him I don't know I made one last ditch attempt on the off chance that she really did need help and I told her that 
I'd let her use my phone if she wanted to call someone. But I wasn't going to give her a ride with my excuse being that I had just driven all the way from two states over and I was going inside to get food. Honestly, I just felt weird about the whole thing and didn't want to give her what she wanted. She 180'd so fast. She started screaming and swearing at me, saying all kinds of terrible stuff and making a huge scene, so I threw up my hands and said, fine, sorry, I can't help you. And I walked away from her and went inside the truck stop. The woman hung around the lot a few minutes and as I was eating my caramel roll, I saw her leaving the lot with the man who had been sitting in the car smoking a cigarette. I was certain that it was a ruse because why bother if she could have just met with him? I mentioned it to a lady inside and she said she saw the strange lady show up there with the man that she left with and she thought it was also super creepy and unsettling and it was very likely that they had bad intentions. I genuinely feel like she was right and my gut feeling was right. I feel like the point was for the strange woman to talk me into giving her a ride and direct me somewhere for the man to follow in his car for evil reasons. A few years back I was working as a Lyft driver in some of my free time to make a little extra cash, but this experience happened when I was not expecting rides ultimately confirming some of the horror stories you might hear. One evening as I was headed home from my day job, I stopped at a Walmart to grab a couple of essentials before getting home. While I didn't have the driver app operating, therefore not accepting rides at that moment, I still had the stickers in my windows indicating that I was a driver. After paying for my things, I headed to my car and began putting my things in the trunk. Almost out of nowhere a woman approached me. She looked distressed and a little disheveled, but no warning flags necessarily jumped out at me quite yet. She asked if I was the Lyft driver she requested, and I replied politely that I was not. Almost cutting me off, she began pleading with me to give her a ride down the street, stating that her sister was in serious trouble and she needed to get to her as soon as she could. Feeling empathetic for her situation, I tried asking what had happened and she blurted back that her sister was in trouble but avoided my actual question. Although I felt bad for the woman, I began getting a little suspicious of her story. As nicely as I could, I told her that I don't do rides outside of the app, to which she replied, it's just down the street a few blocks. I can pay you more than the app would, please. I began backing up towards my door as I continued to tell her sorry that I wouldn't be able to help at this time, blaming the perishables in my trunk. At this time, I was not focused on the warning signs necessarily as I did feel empathetic to her situation. That is until her phone buzzed and she glanced at it quickly, almost in a way so I couldn't see her phone. Odd, I thought to myself. When she slipped the phone back into her pocket, it was when I saw how clunky and small the phone was and clearly was not a smartphone that could have been used to order a lift. I apologized again and tried not to clue her in that warning bells had gone off in my head. I told her, well, hopefully your lift arrives soon and everything's fine with your sister. I got in my car quickly. Luckily, my car has a feature where if you only click unlock once, the driver's side is the only door to unlock. Not that she attempted to open a door, but it did make me feel safer with that feature in this moment. As I backed up my car out of the spot, she moved hastily out of the way and I noticed that her face changed from distressed to what I can only describe as malice. As I got to the end of the aisle, waiting for cars to pass so I could merge and get out of the Walmart lot, I glanced in the rear view mirror as two men got out of the Escalade that had been parked adjacent to me and approached the woman as if angry or annoyed with her and I could see her angrily gesturing toward my car and turned to face them as they continued arguing about something. Finally, I was able to pull out of the aisle just as she followed them back into the Escalade. I work at a retail store that sells parts, feed, and the like. On a slow night, the store manager and I were closing, but it was pretty slow, so he let me go home early. I jumped at this opportunity as I have two jobs that are extremely physically demanding and I'm always tired. 
It's important for you to know that I've been borrowing my brother's car. My mother stole my own car, long story for another subreddit, and this car has many electrical issues. I'll get into that in a moment. My drive home is 45 minutes and it's on those country roads you may have heard songs about. Sure they're great, but there are no street lights. Don't get me started about the quality of the asphalt either. So I'm, I'm in this little Kia which all the gauges and speedometer needles jump around on the dash depending on the humidity and temperature, lucky me, and I have to manually keep track of how much gas is left in the tank by simply doing the math. The gauge cannot be trusted. I guess I messed up that week because on my way home from work that night, the car just started to sputter and just died right there. The electrical was okay, but the engine just quit. I had been texting my other manager throughout the shift. He and I had become friends, he was close to my age, had similar interests, and was cute. But I had shared that our store manager had let me go early, so I texted him and said, hey, what if I told you I was stuck on the side of the highway? Now you may be wondering, why didn't I text this brother that I've spoken of, or why I didn't call another friend? This is because, number one, I knew this manager lived close by and would absolutely be the guy to lend a helping hand. Number two, my brother turned his ringer off at 8pm so he wouldn't even answer. And number three, my brother and I had just moved to this state and at the time, had not made friends with anyone yet. My manager texted back, Hang on, for real? Do you need help? As I was typing a reply, a green Dodge Ram drove up, something like that. A little beat up, but with a nice new set of LED headlights and a light bar on the top. Their high beams and light bar were on, so I couldn't see their faces, and as far as I could tell, at least two men were inside. The driver's window rolled down and I hear an accented voice call out, Hey beautiful, are you okay? How about you hop in the truck, we'll uh, take good care of you. I'm a 5'10", 22 year old woman who, in work boots, is about 6 feet tall. I'm not as built as I was in high school, just athletic enough to handle someone my own size, but not two grown men. I had gotten out of my car to go see if I could tell where the nearest landmark was, but I couldn't, so I had walked back to my car at this point. I stood there with my feet planted. I reached behind my belt, above my rear end, in an attempt to appear as if though reaching for a gun, which I did not have. Foolish? Maybe. Desperate? Absolutely. I pointed up the road with my left arm and said in the meanest girl voice I could, Get the F out of here. Somehow it worked. I have no idea, but it did. The truck sped off like it couldn't get away fast enough, which made me laugh now. I called the police and told them roughly where I was, which took some figuring out since I was so new to the area. Maps wasn't helping a ton. I then called my manager to tell him what had happened. He got there before the cops did, with a full gas can. Turned out, he was literally around the corner at a friend's house watching the game and his friend had a gas can. I later got to meet this guy and his girlfriend, they were very sweet people. He said it was perfect timing as he had turned down a weekend trip with a friend and this other friend randomly invited him over just two hours before this went down. He poured all the gas he had into my car which started nicely and followed me to the nearest station and paid for the rest of my tank. He also bumped my car door close, locking me out so we had to wait for a tow truck for three hours. Definitely a funny way to end the night. We sat on the back of his tailgate and talked the whole time and I even broke down crying after the adrenaline had gone down a bit. He held me by my shoulders and assured me that I was safe. We actually had some good laughs that night which made it very memorable. He told me he admired my ability to see the humor in the situation and how I didn't let it get to me. We've been dating for five months now and I'm almost glad that I almost got kidnapped. I live 10 minutes away from Walmart, but I honestly rather drive 45 minutes to the next town's Walmart. The Walmart by me is just unpleasant. My brother and I one day decided to just go because we needed something quick and was short on time. We went and browsed the electronic section sometimes, they do have cool stuff. With nothing found, I browsed the computers while my brother quickly looked at LED lights. 
As I started walking away, I noticed a tall man with white gray hair walking super close to an older lady I thought that they knew each other. When I passed him, he got super close behind me. My eyes bugged out of my head because I knew how close he was as my older brother looked behind him because I was walking towards him. His eyes bugged so I knew I wasn't just imagining it. He got so oddly close that I decided to turn around to see who he was and I didn't recognize him and darted inside the next aisle where my brother came up behind me and said that I should keep walking, that he's right behind us. Next to electronics, the next aisle is the art and craft supply. We kept walking, my brother peered behind us, and he loudly whispered, Oh my god, he's still following us, go, go! So we made it to automotive, which was the main reason of the visit to Walmart which I was relieved when there was more people around than there was in the electronics. After getting what we needed, we made our way back to electronics to pay. It was over 20 minutes since we'd last seen that Danny Phantom-looking guy. As we turned the corner, we see the guy again. Eyes darted right at me as I tried to ignore it. The ladies at the electronics looked a bit off, and I noticed them speaking Spanish. I picked up that they called security because that guy was just standing there. Meanwhile, in line to pay, security comes and asks this guy if he was waiting on someone and he replied no, and turned away. After we paid, I told my brother that this is why I don't shop around here. As we walked to the front of the store, the same guy was following us out. We ran to the jeep and locked the doors. My brother described his eyes as these predatory hunting eyes, just dead and soulless. I don't know what happened after we left, but... I now don't shop anywhere near my home to avoid the weirdos of my city, and I'm fairly certain that human trafficking happens at that Walmart often. This took place when I was about 17. I'm a female. I moved in with my brother and sister-in-law into their apartment in the city. I'll admit I was a very innocent 17-year-old. I still had a lot to learn about the world and what people were capable of. I worked the evening shift at my job and they let me stay in their spare room while I saved up to get my own place. They used the living room as their bedroom because their other rooms were too small so when I got home from work I either had to park around the back of the building and go in the back door or park on the street out front and walk through an alleyway to get to the back door. One night I got home from work and decided I wasn't ready for sleep yet. It was about 2am and I was still amped up from work so I poured myself a drink and walked around to the front of the building to sit on the front steps and enjoy the night air before bed. While I was sipping my drink, listening to some music on my headphones, someone called out of the building next door and sat down on their steps. It was a young man around my age. After a few moments he started to talk to me. I realized he was pretty drunk, but seemed harmless, so we chatted for a few minutes. He started telling me a story about how he chased some guy with a machete. Start cueing all the red flags. Then his friend also came out and also sat on the steps. His friend was fully wasted. Gonzo, if you know what I mean. Just sitting there holding his head in his hands. So I said, Well, I better get going now. Have a good night and I stood up to walk through the alleyway between the two buildings. I was nervous about going through there, but I was either that or walk all the way down the street and around the block to get to the back of the building. So I said goodnight and started walking through the alleyway to get to the back door, trying to stay calm and not appear freaked out. I look behind me and realize that the drunk guy is following me through the alleyway. He says to me, Where are you going? I said, Oh, have to go home. And he responds, You gonna leave me without a kiss goodnight? I say to him, I don't know you. And he says, Come on, just one kiss. At this point I'm starting to get nervous about where this is going when he snags his jacket on a nail in the alleyway. And I use this moment to make my way out of the alley into my door. He unsnags himself and catches up to me at the back door asking if he can come in. Mind you, I've never met this guy in my life. I tell him, I'm sorry, my brother and sister-in-law are asleep. 
I slowly close the door while he stands there staring drunkenly at me, half expecting this to go sideways. The way I figure, that night could have gone two ways. I was super relieved it ended with him on the other side of the door and me safely in my own house. I never saw him again and I never went out at night by myself to sit on the front steps. I learned a valuable lesson that night. Potentially dangerous situations can creep up on you. You don't always see them coming until they're following you through a dark alley. Try not to put yourself in those situations and anticipate the creepy. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel members. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember... Want some jelly beans? <laughs>